our next speaker, Alex Bradbury, and it's Alex who was, well, the speaker at the original meeting five years ago. So let's see what's happened in the last five years. Thank you. Okay. Uh, great, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so I'm Alex Bradbury, I'm a co-founder and CTO of Low Risk CIC, um, which is a non-profit engineering organization um, specializing in risk 5 system on chip design, tool chains and more. Um, so I wanted to start by uh, sort of talking a little bit about the motivations for um, what we're doing and what sort of led us to starting this. Um, so I think that you know, we've uh, you know, RISC-V, as Rick has explained, is an open source instruction set architecture, very substantial interest in going beyond open standards and looking at um, open source hardware implementations. Um, this has, of course, been become um, standard um, in the software world, um, but the hardware industry has taken uh, a long time to catch up. We'll sort of talk a little bit about some of the reasons behind that, but um, I just highlight that you know, fundamentally the hardware industry stands to benefit from um, shared investment in um, open source, uh, well, tools and um, and IP in you know, system Verilog, system Verilog, Chisel implementations of cores and other um, designs. Uh, just how we um, how we benefit from the software world. Um, benefits include you know, faster time to market, easier to create derivative designs, um, clearly more flexibility in terms of licensing models. Um, auditability, uh, greater options in terms of suppliers, um, which has been a real, um, something which is very attractive to companies who are moving towards RISC-5. Um, there's you know, clearly some movement from um, other sort of conventional, you know, very commonly used commercial ISAs, um, but it's also often companies who are moving away from, um, you know, some internal ISA, which was developed, you know, ages ago, the compiler team, you know, they left a decade ago and it's, you know, very difficult to actually keep um, keep it up to date and supported, whereas clearly moving to a open standard and open implementation removes a whole bunch of um, support cost and support burden. And of course, you know, many companies you're you know hoping to get to the starting point. You know, you're interested in um, at the moment, of course, very on vogue to be producing an AI accelerator or something else. Um, you don't want to spend all your time just putting all the pieces together in order to get to um, a starting point. You know, they a system and chip with a bunch of standard peripherals. Um, just like if you're starting work on a large software project, you're almost definitely going to be taking a whole bunch of uh, existing software off the shelf, just as happened with Android and the Linux kernel and various other um, pieces of the software stack. Um, there's clearly a draw for open source hardware and research, which we're seeing with a um, number of uh, universities who are enthusiastically adopting RISC V and getting involved in open source hardware, as Rick was talking about, um, Zurich have you know been I guess leading the way in terms of you know, producing high quality open source designs, which are then picked up by industry and others. Um, it's particularly attractive for researchers, as um, you know one of the challenges that um, we've had and um, my experience when I was at uh, Cambridge was that we uh, you know it's very it's, well, often you're limited from you can't you, well similarly with the um, uh, the industry case, you can't just take something off the shelf and then make an improvement on top of it, which is typically what researchers are trying to do. Um, you can do that if you're modifying a simulation model, so GEM5 or QMU, um, but a whole bunch of computer architecture research, it either relies on being able to modify the hardware itself or would be much higher quality and more impactful if you're able to take a um, uh, something, uh, ideally a whole SOC design, which is um, somewhere up around commercial quality and then uh, prototype your changes, demonstrate the impact. It's also an example of where um, you know, this sort of uh, reducing the barriers to uh, entry and innovation would benefit benefits industry as well as you know, frequently they are, you know, industry players are frustrated with the fact that you know, a, lot, a lot of the research which comes out isn't you know, that relevant to what they're doing as it doesn't take into account all of the sort of implementation tricks and other things which they're using in their designs. And of course, open source is about much more than the license. Um, you can take a piece of software or a piece of hardware, stick it up on GitHub, throw an open source license on top of it, um, that's clearly necessary, but it's um, you know, nowhere near sufficient to uh, drive adoption, build a community around it. Um, it's you know, clearly you have to think through the development model, um, how you how you can ensure that you have a high level of code quality, what story for support and maintenance is. 
um, how you can build an ecosystem of tools, compilers, um, you know, community members, support forums, meetups, uh, all these sorts of things. Um, and particularly in the hardware world, um, documentation and, all importantly, test and verification. Uh, ship it now and fix it later is not really a viable option with hardware, whereas um, we've uh, perhaps become a little too used to that in the software world. Um, and I just like to sort of highlight here that you know I think one of the key benefits of open source is this you know distributed um, dist this, you know, distributed set of contributors from a range of uh, a range of backgrounds, um, fewer barriers to entry, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean unpaid labour. So I think the, those of us who are um, you know part of the open source community are actually often guilty of you know getting caught up in this kind of romantic notion that ah well you know anybody can you know can contribute from uh, you know, uh, can contribute from their bedroom. You can, you know, go home after work and contribute, which happens sometimes. But um, you know, the most successful open source communities I've been involved in um, have been largely supported by a very um, healthy jobs market. So I've uh, uh, been a member of the LVM community for about, um, I guess, eight years now. And of course, um, that's a you know, compiler developers are like gold dust at the moment. Anybody who submits a few patches to LVM and can demonstrate that they can hack on a compiler. Um, have plenty of options in terms of job offers, and my expectation is that um, it will be, it, it it will be, and I think probably already is the case in open source hardware. Um, and so we kind of set ourselves this goal of um, further supporting and encouraging um, collaborative development of high quality shared infrastructure. And I think one of the reasons that, despite all uh, all of the um, benefits of moving towards open source from the hardware world, this hasn't happened, is um, I think partially there's a higher activation energy for hardware versus software. Um, clearly the uh, model of um, uh, taping, out, uh, taping out a chip, even with a multi-project wafer and sharing the cost with others, is a substantially different um, proposition versus um, shipping a tarball where anybody can compile it. There's a very high cost of failure. Um, you need a team with a range, uh, well, in order to get the, um, to go from your RTL design to a, a chip which people can, can actually use, even a prototype chip requires a whole range of um, uh, specialist expertise, um, where again, we don't have those same sorts of challenges in software. Um, uh, historically, the lack of a high quality open ISA has been a barrier, or at least one where there is uh, a large investment from I guess hobbyists, academia, and industry. Um, they have, um, as I think was touched on before, been previous attempts with uh, Spark, um, a version of Spark being an open standard and um, open risk. But of course, RISC V has you know, actually uh, seems to have been the, the one which has um, got larger scale adoption. <clears throat> And so uh, this is kind of how we see low risk fitting into the open source ecosystem. Uh, so as I you know, mentioned before, we're a not-for-profit company, a um, UK community interest company, um, which means um, that you know, we don't have we don't have shares, we don't have shareholders and pay dividends. Um, any uh, surplus from our activities gets reinvested into serving the community that we target, which is the community of those who benefit from uh, an open source hardware and software ecosystem. Um, and so we see this ecosystem uh, comprising of a range of different organizations, um, obviously the large commercial players that we're all familiar with, the smaller ones, academics, individual contributors, um, community open source community members and other open source projects like LVM, GTC, the Linux kernel, QMU, uh, specification foundations like the RISC V Foundation and others, um, and those which um, act as an IP repository, so the Chips Alliance. Um, and we kind of see ourselves as um, acting as a bridge between a whole range of these organizations working together to produce um, you know, high quality uh, engineering artifacts which can be um, picked up by um, these communities which I mentioned. So the um, uh, open source community members, academia, um, and of course com uh, companies who can, pick, who can pick this up, um, produce chips on it and ship it in volume. And I think I've covered most of this. Um, so we're, yeah. 
Um, and so uh, winding back a bit, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, um, the lowest journey has been you know, going on for a little while now. Um, we started um, back in, uh, yeah, I guess, October 2014. Um, we sort of um, out, spun out of the University of Cambridge Computer Lab, and that was where we were based for the first few years. Um, it sort of followed on the Raspberry Pi project. Um, so uh, I was a took a leading role in the early software work on that platform, and my PhD supervisor at the time, Rob Mullins, was one of the co-founders and trustees of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, a while after that, we were approached by a ex-member of Computer Lab who was interested in um, this challenge of open source hardware and, in the longer term, what it would take to produce something like the Raspberry Pi but completely open source. Um, and this is what kind of led us down this path, um, attracting uh, donations from a private individual and Google at the computer lab. Um, and more recently, um, as I'll sort of uh, talk about in the next few slides, um, it's been a, uh, a sort of a new phase for the company in that we're now scaling up substantially, whereas before we were based at the computer lab and with more of a research bent, um, that remains ongoing, um, but we're now uh, you know, uh, actually trading and um, hiring employees through the community interest company um, up to, uh, well, it'll be seven people from next week, um, eight a few weeks later, and 10 or 11 by the end of the year um, or more. Um, and so uh, recently, um, you may have seen, um, you know, we had a press release about expanding our board of directors. Um, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Dom Rizzo from Google and Ron Minnick, who's not pictured there, but many of you may know from the as a leader of a, and founder of the Core Boot project, as uh, well as active in a whole bunch of other open source projects, um, and uh, Luca Benini, um, who's uh, of course a professor at ETH Zurich and leader of the Pulp project. <clears throat> and so to uh, give a little bit of, I thought I'd. Uh, last slide. Right, um, and so next I thought I'd uh, go through some of our current activities. Um, there is, um, uh, there, we are um, undertaking further engineering work, um, more of which will be announced at a, in due course, um, but these are sort of the activities which are, and of course everything that we will do will also ultimately be open source, um, but I'm sort of giving a list here of the things which are currently open source, available, and um, ready for you to jump in um, file issues against, contribute patches, and so on and so forth. Um, now, as Rick mentioned several times, um, uh, the Zero Risky Core was contributed to us from ETH Zurich. Um, we've been undertaking a lot of engineering work on top of that, um, working with collaborators at ETH, Google, and other contributors. Uh, this is a, a small microcontroller class core of a two-stage pipeline implemented in System Verilog, um, and uh, this little guy over here is uh, Carl the Ibex, who uh, is um, the mascot, which um, the team seemed very keen on uh, on showing, and seem, people seem to enjoy him. Uh, these are a few figures based on some uh, uh, targeting FPGA and ASIC tape out. Uh, I should so the um, some of our friends at the University of Manchester are currently working on a. A tape out using IBEX. Um, this is uh, IBEX plus uh, embedded FPGA, and that's being done in collaboration with Andrew Atwood, Adward at um, STFC. Um, so we're really pleased to see that people are already. I mean, the it's been silicon proven uh, multiple times at um, through projects from ETH Zurich and others under zero under zero risky. But it's great that um, there are um, well this and more projects in the pipeline that will be announced in in due course. Um, since uh, IBEX uh, became part of our sort of uh, portfolio. We've been busy doing a whole bunch of work on it. Um, I think it's, we kind of, the work started around December, but um, we only really um, put a lot of engineering effort behind it around end of April, early May. Um, so I think since that time, even excluding the uh, sort of style and uh, style cleanups and that sort of thing um, about 50% of the code has been rewritten or refactored. A lot of this has been focused on making it more maintainable, fixing lint issues reported by um, industry partners, uh, and um, and it's also been guided by the sort of bug reports we've had working with verification teams, such as applying things like um, Google's RISC-V DD, um, a random instruction generator and test tool, 
Um, there's also been a number of new features, so support for the um, RISC, um, a subset of the RISC-V privilege specification, uh, support for the RISC-V formal interface, which we use as our trace interface, and also um, we'll be using with the RISC-V formal flow with YOSIS. Um, and uh, and sort of more more ongoing. We've been um, really pleased. I'm actually surprised by the uh, quality of bug reports we've been receiving from end uh, end users and industry users. Um, we've uh, uh, I think the uh, sort of quality preciseness of the reports has been beyond what we possibly could have hoped for. In that when bugs are being reported, um, the average bug report tends to have a uh, attached reproducer, waveform. Um, we've um, uh, not had to go to great lengths to try and get um, this information out of our end users. So we're very grateful for people who've been contributing um, book reports on like so far. Um, and we're now at about two working days from book report to um, committed fix. And of course, as we integrate more test verification for risc 5 dv risc 5 form and others, um, we're you know, continually tightening up the design um, I mean, as I mentioned before, zero risky has been taped out multiple times, but um, as is always the case with these designs, even with a relatively simple microcontroller class design, it's pretty easy to encounter edge cases. Um, it's also part of this, part of as we're moving it from something where um, it supported a minimum subset of the spec, which might be sensible for deeply embedded designs to supporting um, a programmer model that's a bit more friendly and what you might be used to from um, sort of current commercial microcontroller cores. Um, so if you read the base RISC-V ISA specification, it doesn't actually mandate precise exceptions, for instance, and things like that. Um, and this uh, naturally comes as a bit of a surprise to most programmers and is uh, not that useful when writing um, when writing a whole bunch of firmware. So we're sort of working on things like that to improve them. Um, we've also been, um, for some years now, uh, sort of leading the effort on the upstream RISC-V LVM uh, toolchain. So I've uh, been doing LVM backend work for about eight or nine years now. Started it um, when I was a researcher at the University of Cambridge. That was initially a downstream backend on a research project called Loki, which gave a whole bunch of exposure to um, backend development work. And with RISC-V, it's been a great opportunity to get directly involved contributing to the um, upstream community there. So I'm the code owner of the RISC-V LVM backend, um, which has just reached a major milestone. Um, it's now graduated from an experimental to an official backend um, for the 9.0 release, which has recently branched and is due to land uh, the end of August. Um, this has uh, been uh, due to um, obviously our efforts at low risk and our growing toolchain team. We now have Luis Marques and uh, uh, Sam Elliott, who recently joined us and has been working on that, um, and of course a growing number of uh, contributors from other companies and universities, so Embercosm, Qualcomm, Google, um, University of Cambridge, Andes Tech have all made notable contributions to help move the uh, the back end forwards. Um, we've, uh, if you want to check out um, our blog, I think I forgot to add a link in here. Uh, in the last week, we had a few posts looking at some of the large-scale testing we've been doing with uh, with BuildRoot. So where we're now able to build, I think about 80% of the BuildRoot packages. BuildRoot being a um, sort of build-your-own Linux distro um, toolset um, toolkit for compiling a whole bunch of standard base packages. Um, create a working root FS, boot it on QMU, um, start nginx, serve HTTP requests. Um, so there's a uh, with you know at the point where you know large and substantial pieces of software are working and well tested, um, as well as of course um, from the beginning we've been building this up in a with an incremental approach in terms of unit tests and torture suites and this sort of thing. Um, so the next step for us there is to uh, further work to uh, improve this through the 9.0 release cycle, um, working with the LVM community and the 9.0 release manager on merging any bug fixes and this sort of thing. And we're also uh, starting some work with the Rust community to improve support on um, for Rust on Linux um, on Linux targets. So the Rust community of in a pretty good state actually with bare metal support um, for both RV32 and RV64. Um, but uh, 
with the uh, for Rust with the Hardflow ABI targeting RV64 GC is a common blocker for people who are um, porting um, modern Linux distros like Debian and Fedora, um, where a number of key packages are now written in Rust, um, at least for the GUI stuff. There's librsvg is perhaps the um, the main one there. Um, so we're uh, keen to uh, work together to help move that forward. <clears throat> And uh, from the beginning, we've been working on a 64-bit SOC platform. Um, this is currently a FPGA-ready release, which you can find on our website with a whole bunch of tutorials, which have always been very well received. We've put um, a lot of effort in trying to make it easy to get started, um, also document some of the key aspects of the uh, Rocket System on Chip Generator, um, which originated from UC Berkeley, who's then been further developed by Sci-5. Um, but it can often be a little bit difficult to get started with. Um, more recently, we've been adding support for the Ariane core for this, so that you can basically, it's a you know, design time configuration option as to whether you build with uh, Rocket or Ariane, but all using the same sort of external interfaces. Um, we've been doing further work recently on open source peripherals like SD card and Ethernet controller. Um, the Ethernet support has now been contributed up to the um, to the to Ariane's um, sort of dem demonstration FPGA distribution, uh, and this is also served as a test bed for new ideas on the research side. Um, so we might have seen some of our previous work on um, Minion cores, which are sort of small cores on the periphery of your system on chip, um, as well as plenty of stuff on tagged memory um, as a offering fine grade memory protection. Uh, this is a brief rundown of um, some you know, milestones on that work, which um, yeah, has been going for, uh, I guess, since around the end of 2014, we sort of kicked off some of the design ideas and then early 2015 was the initial 0.1 release. Uh, and uh, yeah, we've recently been adding um, support for a frame buffer and mouse and keyboard, so it starts to look like a, an act like a you know a real Linux system. I'll admit you're not running Firefox and browsing web at speed on FPGA, but you know you can run an X term and X eyes, and you know these are you know, encouraging things. Uh, and uh, in terms of what's next for low risk, um, uh, I think you can. Uh, with the work I've been talking about, particularly around IBEX and LLVM, which are primarily driven through the community interest company, I think you can see the sort of uh, our approach in terms of uh, sort of detailed, methodical, high quality engineering, working with partner companies, academia, and the wider open source community. Um, we have uh, other projects in that vein will be announced in time. And most importantly, um, as I mentioned before, we are looking to expand uh, further. So we're hiring. Um, please do go and check out our jobs pages. There are uh, firmware design verification, uh, 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 digital designer roles, and, and more. And with that, I'll open the floor for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Alex? Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, I am Maxim, and I just wanted to ask uh, firstly uh, whether you're aware of the ex upcoming experimental Bitmap extension, mm -hmm. and uh, what do you think? Uh, do you think it has a future in perhaps the IBEX core for the really deeply embedded stuff? And also on the high end, I suppose. In the Ariana core, do you think that uh, potentially there's a good chance it'll get incorporated in the future? Uh, I'm really interested in the uh, Bitnip extension, um, so I'm. It'll be interesting to see what happens on the Linux in the Linux space because obviously the distributions have for now standardised around RV64 GC, and so for code which makes heavy use of bit manipulation, it may be worthwhile to have certain functions which are compiled for bit for you know, using that extension and then have the linker select it or otherwise select it after interrogating the platform. Um, but you know this will kind of be the first time on the Linux part of the RISC-V community that we will have had a you know a possibly commonly deployed um, extension, in this case a standard extension. Um, I'm really interested in Bitmanip um, for uh, for embedded cores as well, where those concerns are perhaps um, less of an issue, where most people are you know, recompiling their firmware for, the, for their target device um, from scratch. 
Uh, so we've been looking at Bitminip a bit. It's not on the near-term roadmap for IBEX, and I haven't evaluated as to to what extent it would be sensible for a core design point of IBEX. Um, but certainly, like with the risky core, which um, uh, which Rick was talking about, so a number of the custom pulp extension instructions, it seems it would be very sensible to turn it into deprecate some of those and move towards the standard Bitmanip extensions. Hiya, I'm Ben. Um, what's your experience been uh, as a company working at that curious intersection between open source tooling and very, very commercial tooling? So you mentioned th uh, things like the, the Google's UVM uh, design mm -hmm. verification engine, which is amazing, absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic piece of kit to have, but it runs on UVM and requires tens of thousands of dollars worth of kit to use. Mm -hmm. And then you're also using Yosis and Verilator, which are free and excellent. Mm -hmm. What's it like working at that weird little sliver? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, as uh, those of us who have worked with licensing EDA tools or even beyond that licensing PDKs and so on, it's um, uh, it's a very different world even versus licensing most, I think, a, a lot of other commercial software. It's a very, very secretive industry. There are all sorts of um, very strict rules on confidentiality and that sort of thing. Um, so it's, uh, I think there are challenges an open source project as obviously if you start um, there's a industry pull towards having uh, test benches with things like uh, UVM as that is the like, for better or worse the accepted industry standard um, but of course um, as you say it's not very well not plausible for a lot of um, uh, end users to um, actually run that stuff. Um, I'm pleased that there's seems to be increasing interest and investment in improving Verilator in those sorts of areas. Um, so I think there was a Verilator roadmap talk at um, a recent workshop in the US where Wilson Snyder was talking about future plans for um, extending it to support UVM. Um, so I mean, we're certainly very keen to use um, open source tools wherever sensible and possible. And actually, I think most of the um, commercial companies we speak to are in the same situation. Most of them um, run huge farms of very later simulations because you can run as many as you want for the, of them, and it's easy. Um, but um, of course, um, when 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 it makes sense, we'll um, license and use the necessary commercial tooling. Um, we, you know, intellectually and I guess for the wider open source hardware. A mission. It's um, open source tooling is great, and we'd like to see that continue to flourish. Um, though it's not really a, um, we've kind of feel we're biting off quite a lot at the moment with the um, um, open source hardware designs and associated tool chains and so on. So that's our um, our focus. Andy. Hi there, um, Andy Bennett. So there's been some talk recently about things like BFloat 16, mm. which is the 16-bit floating point optimized for like um, bigger exponents and, and smaller mantises. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's a there's an implementation on Intel and Intel have talked about putting it in hardware and future revision of the chip. Do you see the Risk Five community being able to respond more effectively to re like requirements like that in the future or like ever kind of competing with with those kind of things? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting because the, the very sort of different trade-offs in those models because of the advantage of RISC V being an open ISA that everybody can extend and have their own extensions to is that even before there's sort of widespread community um, support for something and you know before something is adopted as an official standard or it may even never be adopted as official standard, you can go ahead and add support for it to your chip if you think that it will be useful for your target community and um, well, custom, your target customer base. Uh, one of the advantages that the um, more controlled ISAs have is of course that you can choose to add a feature like that and you can add it to the next, um, you know, um, either uh, the sort of, uh, you know, the next, uh, you know, head um, head of a product line uh, um, IP, uh, licensable IP block, or of course shipping chip in the case of Intel, which immediately gets you um, huge distribution of, of this. And so it's, um, uh, yeah, on the one, the RISC V community has the advantage that it's easy to um, try out these ideas and integrate them into, uh, in, into a product, um, though, uh, with that further decentralization means that there's less control. There's no there's no one who can say, ah, well, from tomorrow or risk five chip or, or future risk five chips or risk five chips above a certain level should have this feature. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. 
Um, I mean, I, I think that there, the ultimate, obviously the decentralized model will lead to you know, greater innovation, but um, clearly possibly greater diversity with people and um, people trying different ideas and potentially it might take a bit more time to, you know, they might, we may see that there are some cases where parallel approaches are taken and they converge later. Um, but it's been great actually with, with a bit manipulation extension that was mentioned earlier. And that's been a, you know, one of the big concerns about RISC-V from the beginning will be, has been that it'll just fragment all over the place. Um, but for, with bit, the bit, bit manipulation extension, um, everybody, uh, a wide range of companies have been very, very interested in seeing extensions for that. A number of them tried sort of their own extensions, but very rapidly realized that the way forwards on this is to collaborate and get something um, standard, which is accepted by the community. Um, so I think that despite the fact that there's not a, um, there's nothing forcing you to work together, the sort of general, um, you know, market pressures of not wanting to have duplicated work um, means that there is a good push towards collaboration on these sorts of things. And maybe we'll, uh, so we'll see something similar with um, BFLOAT 16 or other related standards. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Alex. Um, and I hope Alex will be able to stick around for a bit. Um, uh, um, after, after the meeting. Um, our final uh, speaker today is uh, Ben Marshall. Uh, it's Jeremy. Oh, yes. Ask Sorry, Ray. Yeah, this is, this is Rick. May I, may I just make a comment on the bit manipulation discussion that, that happened there? Because I think it's a, it's a good one. It's a really good question. And, and just like that, a comment to it if I can for two seconds. Of course. Yes, please do. Oh. I should have asked you questions. Yes. No, it's okay. Uh, I lied. It'll probably be closer to 120 seconds. Um, uh, so the, the comment ar around the bit manipulation uh, extension, standard extension that's being done in the foundation is, is a good one. And as Alex said, there's, uh, and I pointed out in the risky core, the, bit, the, uh, the team at ETH Zurich had, had implemented their own custom extensions for bit manipulation because there wasn't a standard set of extensions at that time. And it's, it's further evidence of being able to, if you will, have some proof points of some functionality that, that folks can implement that then eventually can, uh, you know, form the basis of a standard. And now the instructions as implemented by the team at ETH Zurich uh, are not the exact same as what's been the proposed bit manipulation uh, extension, although there's lots of similarities and, we, and we've done some work. And in fact, you know, our sponsor companies as as is the open hardware group and low risk uh, as well we're all members of the risk five foundation and are contributing to how that standard extension evolves and have provided feedback based on the experience we've had with the risky core um, and there will be a frozen version of the risky core that supports the current um, private extension or custom extension of bit manipulation instructions that the Zurich team has done, as well as a future version of the RISCI core that supports the standard extensions um, as that standard becomes ratified inside the foundation. 